So uh, um, just a couple words before we get going is just to say this is a very important part of Popple. Uh, so we're actually very happy to have four platinum sponsors, sponsorships by companies who make it available, to make everything available to all the things that we're doing here and openly and, and supporting actually the activities we have are absolutely critical. I can tell you that if you want to run a, an, an, an operation where also we make it possible to lots of, for lots of students to come and, uh, and not have to charge them the full cost actually in reality of uh, actually attending here. So this is absolutely critical and very, very, very important to have um, you know, Microsoft research and as you will see actually our three other platinum partners actually uh, helping us uh, make Popple widely um, open. So, and it's my great pleasure then to say hi to Tom. Tom Ball. Uh, Tom is uh, known to many of you, but let me say a couple of words and uh, of us here. So, uh, Tom is principal researcher at Microsoft Research. He has a very, very uh, distinguished uh, research career behind him. He's also a management career. So, let me say a couple of words about both of those, if I may. So, uh, uh, Tom, many of you might actually know fr from his in work together with his colleagues. On, on SLAM and uh, the uh, uh, static driver verifier, a lot of the work that it was that brought static um, model checking and model checking into the world of actually verified software. Uh, but I'm old enough to remember many other things that uh, you actually did previously. So uh, you know he's done absolutely seminal work in slicing, tracing, profiling, software visual visualization. With um, he's contributed to many of those things that you will, if you look him up, you will see that Tom's name pops up over and over again. So um, it's really great to have you. And of course, I should also mention that you got the, uh, you're an ACM fellow for your contributions to uh, um, software analysis and uh, debugging. So software visualization, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you've done. So as a manager, you've actually also been in charge of pushing a lot of the work that uh, has been happening in various places, but in particular in Microsoft, automatic, uh, theory improving, program verification, testing, empirical software, engineering, and so on. And very importantly, I think, is your current uh, engagement in actually pushing you know, actual computing programming into the hands of, of, of children and youngsters by having concrete programs um, being run on physical computers, again, in the uh, Microsoft uh, MakeCode mm -hmm. um, platform. So uh, there could be said much more, but I think <laughs> I'm taking your time now. So <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you. So I, I'm, I'm all. I'm all. Thank, thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for thank you for coming up. Um, so today I'm really going to talk about the work of other people at, at Microsoft Research. It's also a call for you to engage with us through internships, through visiting us, through working with us. I will talk a lot about verification because that's something that's one of our strong points, I think, for, for nearly uh, two decades now. Uh, and I'm going to mention a, a bit about some of the open source uh, uh, tooling that we make available. Uh, so actually, Microsoft Research started back in 1990. For those of you who don't know the history, uh, Nathan Mirvold, who was then the CTO, proposed the idea that Microsoft should invest in a basic research lab for the health and the future well-being of the company. Uh, in 1990, 1991 is when Microsoft Research was founded, and Rick Rash had left CMU to, to lead Microsoft Research. Uh, so that's uh, almost 30 years now. I've been with Microsoft since uh, 1999. Uh, so this is my 20th year. Um, today, what does Microsoft Research look like? Um, we, have, we have MSR divided into essentially two equal parts. MSR Labs, think of that as the classic MSR, which is the bottom-up curiosity-driven basic research looking at the long term. That's headed by Eric Harvitz. And then MSR Next is, uh, is a, a more product-focused uh, uh, part led by Peter Lee that looks at really incubating uh, new businesses, new technologies, and actually new products, uh, uh, working with researchers, but having uh, and having researchers, but having a lot more engineering muscle. Um, that, that said, we also have many, many research scientists, researchers, and scientists who work in the rest of the company. So MSR does not have a lock on the PhDs. Uh, many of you know Sumit Gawani. He went and founded a new group. Uh, in, a, in a Microsoft in, in Azure, and we work closely with him to this day. So uh, Microsoft Research has grown. It's diversified uh, in terms of its approaches uh, to uh, science and technology, uh, and we work, uh, we have many uh, partners across, across Microsoft. 
if you think about our mission, there's three there's three parts going from the left to advance the state of the art, primarily in computer science, although we have economists and social scientists uh, we have uh, theoretical physicists as well. Uh, the second is to rapidly transfer innovations uh, to our product partners, so to have business impact. Uh, and third is to incubate uh, disruptive technologies and new business models, because working with the product group, you're working basically in their business model. What if you have some new idea that doesn't fit inside the current product group thinking? Um, so this is the third, the third part. Uh, if we if we uh, think about uh, all the areas that Microsoft Research covers, it's all areas of computer science uh, plus more. And if you're wondering, you know, where's our area? There it is: programming languages and software engineering. And uh, here I've drawn uh, blue lines to some of the other areas we work very closely with. So we are working. Uh, I'm thinking about what does machine learning mean from a programming language perspective? How do you use program program analysis and, and synthesis? techniques to do better data management, uh, how do we have better compilers and runtime for our hardware, uh, how do we make computing easier, uh, uh, quantum. So uh, those are sort of the satellite areas, of course, uh, uh, here uh, and in this venue, programming languages is central uh, to what we do at Microsoft Research. And we have quite a, quite a few labs around the world uh, that, are, that are working uh, on programming languages. The main uh, the main labs are, are Redmond, uh, Cambridge, and India uh, that have programming language expertise. That's not to say there aren't uh, on the east coast of, of the United States or in Asia. Uh, there are programming language people there, but I would say the three main labs uh, with the programming language expertise are Redmond, uh, Cambridge, and India. And you'll meet some of the people hopefully today. Uh, we have a lot of different academic programs and ways to work uh, with you in academia. Uh, Microsoft Research, uh, we hire from academia, junior PhDs. Uh, we started off in the 90s actually hiring uh, tenure professors to get new groups started. Uh, and we have many, many different types of programs. Uh, we have internship programs, we have faculty fellowships, uh, we have graduate research fellowships. Uh, and if you, um, if you search for uh, Microsoft Research academic programs, or you um, go to the, or you go to the, and you find the website. You'll see there's there's a whole list of different programs, and I won't enumerate them, but just uh, point out uh, that oh, that's very interesting. So something happened. Uh, faculty fellowships, the Ada Lovelace Fellowship, uh, the Microsoft AI Residency Program is a new program. Uh, we have a lot of things uh, that are going on. Uh, some specific to North America, some specific to Europe, some worldwide. Uh, we also have career opportunities, um, and uh, this is the time where we're selecting interns. Uh, if you go to aka.ms slash popple, you'll see a career tab there. If you're still looking for an internship, there are internship opportunities. Uh, we're also doing full-time hiring, both postdoc uh, and uh, full-time research opportunities. So uh, I will repeat this URL many times, aka.ms slash popple, if you want to learn more about the internship opportunities opportunities and the, the full-time uh, full hiring. Okay, so that was, that was the just broad overview of, of MSR and who we are, what we do at a very general uh, setting. Now I want to dive in and tell you about some of the projects uh, that are going on in programming languages and point out uh, who, are, who are some of the people here at Popple working on those projects. So I'll go through each of the three, uh, each of the three areas uh, very quickly. Um, in, uh, in advancing the state of the art, you might not know it, but we've, we've had a, a two decade old effort around quantum computing. That's an actual quantum computer somewhere in all that math mess that, that we've been building. And we've actually created a SDK, the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit, and a language. Uh, Chris Desfori's championed this so that you can actually, uh, actually see what our, our language for this computer when it's ready. <laughs> Uh, is like, and you can do simulations with that. Um, also, I think that will be of interest to you, uh, homomorphic encryption. We are world experts there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kristen uh, Lauder here is the leader of that effort. Uh, the idea is to work directly on encrypted data and have algorithms that work on that. Uh, the RISE group and many others in programming languages are working uh, with this group 
to, to understand how we can, uh, how, how we can uh, uh, make this more of a reality and uh, make it uh, 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 through compilers and runtime. Uh, I what I wanted to do is a little bit more of a deep dive. How many have heard of the Everest project? Okay, a few of you. Okay, so this will uh, be a review. Um, one of the things that we're very strong in is, uh, is, is verification. Uh, and uh, one of the things we've been looking at and working now for, uh, for about uh, four years is a verified version of HTTPS. So if you know a little bit about HTTPS, it relies on the transport layer security, or TLS. Uh, and when you go to a site and uh, you get the, the lock, it means your, your data is being uh, encrypted. Uh, this is the most widely deployed security, probably about half of the internet traffic. Uh, and we all depend on this. Um, so what's, what's the properties we want? Uh, out of uh, TLS, it's a secure channel. So we have our, our keys, public key infrastructure, we have an adversary sniffing on our traffic. Uh, as long as that adversary can't uh, access our long-term credentials, we don't want them, uh, they should not be able to inject data into the stream uh, or read the stream and, and get our data out of it. Um, so that's the ideal. Uh, what's the reality? The reality is there are 20 years of attacks and fixes uh, on TLS, ranging from low-level buffer overflows uh, to lax certificate uh, parsing um, uh, to side channels, and so many, many, uh, many, many fixes and patches. And the idea of Everest is to uh, uh, build uh, from a clean slate um, uh, a verified HTTPS implementation. But really, I think of that as a TLS uh, down to the level of uh, network buffers before you get to the untrusted network of uh, TCP and UDP. So we have we want to have strong verified security, widespread deployment. So not just a verified component, but it it should be actually we should uh, we should get efficient code out of it. Uh, we should have trustworthy, usable tools and grow expertise in Microsoft in the industry in doing high assurance software engineering and all of it open source. So this is based on uh, work that's gone in in Cambridge and Redmond on F7, now the F star language, uh, which is a um, higher order dependently typed uh, language that makes use of Z3 during its type checking. Uh, this, uh, this project is looking at a number of different uh, properties from basic memory safety and type safety uh, to the functional correctness uh, to secrecy as well as cryptographic security. So the idea here is to really go multiple levels uh, to, and in the end, provide uh, a guarantee that these attackers uh, will not be able to break, uh, to break into a TLS the way they have, uh, the way they have in the past. Uh, everything here is written specifications and implementations uh, in F star, though there is actually a way for us to also write verified uh, assembler, the Veil project. Uh, and uh, so far, a number of the low-level crypt crypto primitives that have been verified and extracted to C code have actually been incorporated uh, in Windows as well as uh, Firefox and uh, soon to be Linux. So all this work, F star, uh, as well as TLS, all the cryptographic primitives, everything is being done out in the open. Uh, and we generate very readable C code that is, is we, we've taken to our partners uh, who are doing these systems and convince them to replace their existing implementations with the ones that were uh, derived from the Everest project. So not only you know, uh, is it, is it uh, a boon because we've, we've done the proof of correctness, but the efficiency of the generated C code is on par, or in many cases better, uh, better than the existing handwritten C code. Uh, there are, this Everest is a huge project which really speaks to uh, the global nature of MSR as well as our uh, uh, desire and ability to collaborate widely. So this is a joint project of uh, three MSR labs that I pointed out before, INRIA, uh, as well as a university, CMU in Edinburgh, and many, many interns. So it's one of our, one of our flag, uh, flagship projects for uh, formally, formal verification. Uh, and uh, this is something that we uh, continue to invest in, and we really believe uh, that as part of the industry, uh, making the software better, showing better ways uh, to create uh, trustworthy software uh, is, is something that benefits everyone. 
um so this is this is a great great project many many people if you're on the everest project will you please stand up ah please i know you're here okay so so there's a bunch of people here ah you can look around and see their faces chris hobwitzel nick ah jonathan ah ah from cmu ah ah we have ah we have if you want to know more about everest ah you can ask ask these folks Good folks, and again, if you want to know, thank you all. Uh, if you if you uh, if you want to know more about Everest, we have two new blogs. Again, aka.ms/popple. Uh, you can read more. You can meet, read more about it. And Jonathan Fritzenko did a wonderful podcast, so you can listen to him uh, as well. Uh, uh, yeah, and and that's a, a, gr a really really wonderful project. So uh, so that's Everest. Uh, let's move on from that to um, tech transfer. So, how do we impact the product groups? Um, there's a, there's a lot going on there. Uh, if you if you hadn't realized, Microsoft's uh, changed its business model radically over the last 20 years. 20 years when I I joined, we 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 basically sold software, but now we uh, sell services, and those services run on Azure. Uh, Azure is a, a huge distributed system, a global a uh, set of data centers all linked together to date over 100 data centers worldwide uh this is a major major investment uh of the company into big iron all around the world uh and we need to keep that up and running highly available secure uh keep customers uh, data private so uh there's big cost to it and uh there's also a big problem uh if the cloud is down you're going to read about it in the new york times and furthermore because we're now in the world of service level agreements when cloud is down we pay we pay out to the users right so it's quite quite a different world that microsoft operates in and so this is a uh uh this is a a a survey uh and uh various uh uh numbers here in this table from uh this cloud down survey about how much it's going to cost you if you're out half a day to a day uh provider one these have all been anonymized but basically you're talking about billions of dollars of losses very easily uh you know uh for major cloud outages so it's very very critical uh when we think of the data centers that we think of them like uh like uh, not just hardware but configurable programmable systems where they're always changing because the hardware is changing we're adding new hardware new software we need to be able to verify uh statically and dynamically that the data center is running correctly uh so there's configurations uh, to the routers uh, to the cabling to the software and there's there's plenty of opportunities for people to make mistakes and you make a you make a mistake it's not caught uh part of your data center is not available or you bring down you know a, a lot of vms so we have a big project that started really about 4 years ago uh generally called network verification uh Nikolai Vierna, George Vergesi, others at MSR uh, started this up working with folks in Azure uh, and now we have we have a much larger group. The idea is uh we want to be able to uh take all the information that defines what the data center is, router configurations, the cabling, as well as rules, uh, a set of specifications about where traffic should be going in the data center, where it shouldn't be going. And we want to very very quickly check as soon you know every 5 minutes in the data center that that everything's okay and we don't want to miss any any bug we also don't want any false alarms and we want to do this over thousands of routers and millions of routes okay so it's a whole different verification problem in a very dynamic and changing system uh and uh uh two people here Nuno and Andre Nuno Lopez and Andre Rebochenko who are hopefully maybe in the audience um i may ask them to stand up later have created something called the network logic solver as part of our network verification effort and what this does is it takes all the information that defines essentially the data center uh as well as the current set of vms uh it it does a whole complicated control plane computation it basically does a reachability analysis a transitive closure if you will over all the possible routes and paths and then it has a set of properties that it checks and it has to do this very fast uh and basically uh on a on a regular cycle as changes are going in so that in the end uh the operators of the data centers are are getting reports uh from these uh logic analyzers that are essentially always checking 
the state of the data center against a set of specifications. So if you want to know more about this, uh, find Nuno or Andre. Are you guys here? I'll make you stand up. Uh, oh, there they are in the back hiding. OK, so, so if you want to know more about network verification and the work, the very important work that they're doing, um, you know, please find them. They're here at Popple. And, and this, is a, this is really, really interesting, um, really interesting work. The other, the other thing that we have going on, uh, popping up sort of multiple levels of the stack, is, is a project called Calc Intelligence. And Andy Gordon, who's, who's here, uh, is leading this effort. Uh, and uh, the, idea, the idea here is that you know, at, at a much higher level in our stack, uh, we still also do sell uh, uh, software, um, uh, Word and, and PowerPoint and the Office suite. Uh, and there are many, many, many uh, programmers out there who are the Excel users. If you, if you, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the numbers, you have maybe over 100 million worldwide users. But in terms of people who are actually writing actively in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Excel, uh, macros and uh, script, uh, potentially around 18, 18 million total developers, about 11 million pro and, and 8 million uh, at home. And um, they're basically writing in a programming language, although you know, it doesn't look like it, where you have references and nested functions, if statements, and everything split over these cells. Um, so, so it's been realized for quite a few years that this is a programming language, but one that limits uh, the user and uh, is lacking things that, in our community, we like a lot, like data abstraction, data typing. Uh, so what's been going on lately uh, is to remove, to remove these limits uh, to what a domain expert can do in Excel and to make it possible uh, for Excel programmers uh, to, to incorporate into the spreadsheet abstractions and data types that really more uh, closely fit, fit their domain rather than trying to make everything that they want into a table, which is another way to, to go with Excel. So the idea is why not be able to use uh, functions uh, and define them in, a, in, in the way we, we like to do in, in Popple, or, or have data types that reflect the end user domains, such as uh, ones we know, arrays and vectors and records, uh, even, even uh, new data types defined by third parties. Um, so what's, uh, what's going on in Excel, uh, and this was, this was announced last year, is uh, we're taking it beyond text and numbers. Uh, if you see here uh, in this animation, we're actually defining uh, in, a, in a cell, although it comes out looking like multiple cells, uh, a filter function, an array function. Uh, these are, these are, uh, these are uh, new, new ways to define functions uh, in single cells that have, uh, uh, that have the effect uh, uh, of uh, what we would have to do in the past of, of programming many, many cells. So a cell can hold an array. It can hold uh, whole information, like an entire stock history, uh, information about a country. Uh, and so there's a rich data type, uh, uh, and this has all been retrofitted into the existing Excel language. Uh, so if you want to know more about this, uh, please talk to Andy Gordon, who's here. Uh, and uh, there are internship, oh, here's Andy in the front. There are internship opportunities as well as a new blog article about, uh, about this. So this is, uh, this is really exciting work, really taking one of the more, most popular uh, programming environments in the world and, and actually bringing uh, real programming abstractions into it. Uh, the other thing, people ask me what I've been working on, so I'll just make another, another plug. What about the, the kids who aren't programmers yet? So I've been working on something, uh, and we have a product called Make Code, which is a programming environment uh, for programming microcontroller-based devices uh, in your web browser. Uh, using both uh, Blockly and uh, TypeScript. That's actually uh, TypeScript in the background there. Uh, and we've been working with hardware partners, uh, uh, in particular the BBC and the Microbit is a small device, uh, over the last three years uh, to create programming environments that make it very simple for teachers and students from middle school on up uh, to create uh, to create programs that run on, on battery-powered embedded devices. And so here's like a, every day I can go to Twitter and see, uh, 
see some students working. it's it's a really interesting part of the job that we not only think about the professional developer and the person in the data center, but we think about the enterprise developer, the person with the spreadsheets. but microsoft is also investing in in ah and cs education and make code. i can tell i can tell you more about that project um so there's there's a lot more to say i want to wrap up by talking about the 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 third part which is disruptive technologies uh and there's some pretty amazing things uh peter lee who's well known to the popple community uh programming language uh researcher professor at cmu he's now a vice president uh he's the head of next uh he started a project uh for putting data centers underwater so why would you do such a thing well it's a very interesting idea there's a lot of cooling in the sea um it's uh and 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 a whole number of reasons make it interesting to go and start to investigate uh what it would mean to have offshore data centers so this is one of these projects where you first hear about it and you go okay that's sort of out there but this is some of the things that next is doing uh they're 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 prototyping uh new ways of thinking where to put computation uh, you may have also heard another thing that's a pretty big disruption for Azure is done by Doug Berger called Project Catapult uh, is to take FPGAs and put them in the data center uh, and connect them all in a high speed network. So instead of using a standard NIC for network control, uh, have an FPGA programmed uh, to do the network traffic and the packet filtering, but go beyond that and also be able to put uh, machine learning workloads on this. Uh, so Azure is one of the uh, is one of the uh, prime examples of, of sort of hardware innovation where we're taking FPGAs, uh, putting them into the data center, and doing quite a bit. I don't know that I'm going to have time uh, to talk about Parasail, but um, uh, Mata Musavathi was supposed to be here. Uh, unfortunately, he's, he's not able to make it. This is another potentially disruptive technology where we take uh, inherently sequential algorithms and figure out how to parallelize them uh, using symbolic techniques. And I'll just flash the slide up that shows some of the uh, results here uh, where we've taken essentially uh, a whole set of different types of algorithms ranging from regular expression matching uh, uh, to uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent and figured out how to take algorithms that really have uh, loop carried dependencies but effectively parallelize them while retaining uh, the sequential semantics. So it sounds like magic, but no, it's science and really some very interesting uh, work going on there as well. Okay, so I'm gonna skip, skip over that because I don't have time. Ah, yes, there's the parasail summary. Okay, so uh, that is it. I'm I'm at zero. Uh, thank you. I want to re remind you: go to aka.ms/popple. That has information about our presence here at Popple. Who is here? Who they're in it? Who, who's here? The names of the people here. The projects we're involved with. It also has pointers to all the open source tools that we have, primarily oriented at programming language and verification. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Well, you mentioned Peter Lee. Yeah. Um, I should mention here that uh, Peter Lee and I were co-chairs of Popple Paris, 1997. So, anyway, but uh, please. It is 6:30, so yeah. yeah. It's 6:30 on the dot. Okay. You now, if you have questions, any quick question? Or I'm sure you can catch. I'll be around. You can catch Tom actually out in the social hour, and please also check out the uh, the student research you know posters. It's not accidentally happening today or now because uh, Microsoft is also uh, a main, the main financial supporter of the student research competitions that ACM holds also here. So thanks also for that. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for coming.